Good morning. Good morning. All right. So we have four of your fellow students that found something better to do this Friday morning. Thanks for being here. Um, I have been impressed uh, when Christy reached out to me and said, hey, this is what Herzing wants to do. Um, what could you put together for us? And first of all, I said, well, how forward thinking for the university to say there's things that we can do with orientation to give the students skills that they're going to need while they're in school. So as we talked, I asked, uh, you know, what's happening with the students after year one, after year two, and they talked about um, the dropout rate. And then when they started following up and found out that a lot of times it had to do with life is busy, my bag is too full, so what goes is school because I can always pick that up later. Okay. Uh, so we came up with resiliency and I talk about that it's life's loss and found. Because you'll find out today, every time you lose something, you will find something. And that's a great thing about resiliency. Um, so you are involved with a wonderful university here. Everything I've seen and watched so far. And how cool to be the first group in the brand new building. They literally, about 11 p.m. last night, got everything up and running. All right, so <clears throat> this is me. Uh, got some education, got some certificates. Here's what I do, spent a lot of years at Quad Graphics. And then uh, I always say two things I'm really proud of is the books that I authored a chapter in. It was never a plan. And a friend of mine called me and said, hey, there's this lady named Trisha. I set up a conference call for you to talk to her at like 3 o'clock tomorrow. I said, okay. You have a friend like that that says, I got something for you to do, but you trust them so you don't even ask what it is? All right, I'll talk with her. We get on the phone. She tells me she's a publisher. I said, oh, so you want me to help you find some writers? She goes, well, no. Jennifer gave me your name because I'd like you to author a chapter in my book. And literally, I was taking this call from my truck. And as fate would have it, I was parked right outside the old Boston store over here because I was coming from Milwaukee but couldn't get anywhere fast enough, so I thought I'll pull into Brookfield Square and just sit there. And she said, here's what I do. I get authors to write chapters and I publish the books. And my last four books have been bestsellers on Amazon and in at least three categories. And I'm sweating sitting in my truck. Like, I don't write, I speak. I get constipated between my head and my pen. And so we talked for about a half hour and I said, well, I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to pass. She said, well, the contract's in your inbox. So I get home that night, I open it up, and I'm like, I'm really not going to do this, am I? And the first book is on hope. And I'm like, Phew. so she calls me three days later. She goes, did you start writing yet? I go, nope. I go, it's 3,000 words. She goes, that's not that much. Who in here is a pretty fluent writer? Like freestyle writer, not your college APA style. No one? You're making me feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> 3,000 words. I have a friend who writes. She would sit down and write that in about an hour, then walk away and edit it. It took me a long time to write. And then, then the book was published. It went on Amazon. It made bestseller in four categories. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. Still hadn't read the book. The book came. I was afraid to read it because all these other authors had been writing for years. And I read it, and then I panicked again because my chapter was not like any of the other chapters. They all wrote from personal experience with hope. I wrote from the perspective of a coach, a life coach. And I'm like, oh no. Well, in that contract, I had committed to two books because <laughs> one just wasn't enough. And the second one was on the journey to forgiveness. So when that one started, I called Trisha and say, can you help me a little bit on marketing for the first book? And as we talk, oh, hey, by the way, what did you think of my chapter? She says, why do you ask? I go, because Trisha, my chapter was not like anybody else's. She goes, that's what I loved. She goes, right from the coach's perspective again on, on the forgiveness book. So I did, and that was like four months later, and that one hit bestseller in four categories on Amazon. So you are looking at a best-selling author. <laughs> so it was never, ever on the horizon for me. 
Uh, but now, anybody know Re Reggie LaBerge? She's in Waukesha, she owns a publishing company. She called me the other day, said, I read your books. I read your chapters. She said, I'm ready for your book. You want to write it? I started sweating again. So, you know, that's me. I just, um, I tell people, I spent a lot of money. Doesn't mean I'm any good. It just means I really invested in me, so I have lots of tools for my clients. So I do organization development work. I'm a life and leader coach, and I do professional speaking. So the speaking, you know, conferences, leader days in companies in the community. Life and leader coach, I do one-to-one -one coaching. So my clients right now are 14 years old to 68 years old. And any topic you can imagine, from I can't get out of my own head, uh, I've been bullied. I am the bully. I've been in trouble with the law. Right up the gamut to what I call pre and post trauma. Uh, I recareered by choice or not by choice. Uh, pre and post medical condition. I've lost a spouse, I've lost a sibling, I've lost a child. Um, to I woke up today and I just can't do this job anymore. To hey, can you help me get ready to interview? Because I'm going to put my name in the hat for a, a C suite position and then anything in between. And within the last year, what has, uh, I've attracted is some post-addiction clients, which has been interesting. So I created a collaboration with a psychologist and a chiropractic neurologist, and we evaluate to make sure they're far enough post-addiction, because I do not belong in rehab. So it goes something like this. Um, individual goes to detox, then they go to rehab. 30, 60, 90, 120 days. They usually release them on a Tuesday and they're feeling really good, like this is awesome. And they wake up Wednesday and they feel awesome. They own their life again. They decide what they're going to do. They go through the whole day Wednesday. They wake up Thursday morning and they go, oof, where, where is everybody? What do I do now? That's where I can come in as a life coach and face them forward and say, right, where do you want to go with your life? The organization development work is companies hire me to come in and look at people, process, and tools. Okay. You get the people right, they'll tell you what, where the pain points in the process are, we'll fix those, and then do you have the right tools to support. Okay. So these are the two questions that I get all the time, and I, I just simply address it now because a lot of people don't know. Anybody in here uh, want to admit that they've had a life coach or a leader coach? Okay, so here's the questions I get. Is how do I know I need a coach? I say boredom, alignment, and hunger. You wake up one day, you're just a little bored with life. So what do you do? You go to work and you volunteer for a project or you volunteer in the community to get extra work. And you feel good. However, that's just a Band-Aid. You wake up again later on and it, you're, just, you're out of alignment. Some people call it out of balance. And this is where the great stories start. Good morning. Nice pants. And here's the stories that says, well, I'm, I'm the breadwinner. I carry the insurance. I went to two years of college, four years of college, eight years of college. Okay. It's a family-owned business. I'm a man who made it in a woman's world. I'm a woman who made it in a man's world. And frankly, I don't even know what that means anymore. Or they say, you know what? All my neighbors and friends say, I've got the best job ever. And you just keep telling yourself a story until one sticks and you go, ah, yeah, that feels good. I'm supposed to be here. And then the next one is hunger. I say you wake up in the morning, you're hungry. You work all day, you're hungry. You go to bed, you're hungry. You wake up tomorrow, you're hungry. And it is not a physical hunger. It's a soulful, passionate hunger to be doing something that you are meant to do and something that aligns with who you are. And it's usually at alignment and hunger that people call and say, Krista, can we meet? Okay. So then their next question is, well, what will a life coach do for me? And I say, I'll be your fog light and your mirror. Think about the road that's right outside your driveway. You have driven it thousands of times, but then in comes the fog and you pull out with your car and the fog plays with your depth perception. The depth perception plays with your confidence and you just want to turn around and go back home. When you're in the muck of life and you're not sure, you're kind of confused, I'll shine the fog light out there 
and we'll see what's out there. Okay? And I'll be your mirror because self-reflection is critical. I will hold that mirror up and say, what do you see? What did, what did you learn? What do you want to be? Okay? And then I create a safe space. You have to be able to show up you. Say it the way you want to say it and not worry about how you choose your words and be very comfortable that what we talk about stays with us. Uh, coaching is where you partner on the journey, which makes it different from therapy and counseling. Coaching we do together. Usually therapy and counseling they do to you. Okay? But I have found out in my years of coaching that the most powerful thing I can do for my clients is I ask questions from the outside so they can answer them from the inside. They already have the answers. They just get buried in life. Okay? So that's a life and a leader coach. Okay? And every now and then, I'll get a call from an executive or an executive assistant that said, hey, uh, so-and-so is looking for a coach. Would you like to come have a 30-minute chat? I said, sure. And a year and a half ago, a uh, Fortune 400 company in Milwaukee, the executive said, I don't know. I go, okay, let's just stop, because clearly this isn't a fit. But before I go, tell me what's here. And he goes, well, I want an executive coach. I don't want a life coach. And I said, great. Before I go, let me leave you with one thought. Every leader is rooted in a person, and every person is rooted in a life. You have to coach the whole person. Body, mind, spirit. It, it has less to do with the position you hold and more to do with who you are. Make sense? Okay, that's me. I'm a mom of three. Oldest son went to UW-Milwaukee, uh, works just down the road at Symmetry. He's my little IT geek. Son number two, he's married. Uh, he's a salesman for Argonne Medical. And his wife works at Rogers Memorial Hospital. My son number three is going to be a senior in high school out in Heartland. So next year, after 31 years, I'm going to be an empty nester. And I'm not going to go buy a dog. I, I don't get that. People become empty nesters and they go buy a dog. Are you kidding me? I'm looking for some freedom. Yeah. OK, so today's format is interactive. Okay, you've got a participant packet. You've got a pen for a reason. You're going to do some self-reflection today. We're going, to, we're going to be doing some talking. Okay? Get the most out of this. Get the most out of this. Um, so where are we going today? We're going to talk about get you to know what resilience is. There's some science behind it. And what's the reality of your resilience? Uh, uh, and you're going to face it and go after it. And I'm going to give you a little, little token to take with you to help. Okay. So um, here's what I want to tell you. A student in the very, very first session um, I think it was two years ago, said to me when she came in and she saw the packet, and she said, oh, are you an expert on resiliency? And I said, well, I wouldn't say an expert, but uh, I've experienced it. And she goes, well, what's the data you've collected? And I said, I've got some data for you. Okay. So here's the deal. I, I used to have six slides on data to bombard you. Well, it, that's boring. So it's now down to, I think, two slides. If you want to go look up the data on resiliency, have at it. But I stand before you telling you I struggled with this. In 2009, I enrolled at Alverno to, take, to do my master's. I was traveling all the United States. I had three young boys, and I was working 50 hours a week. And every weekend, I went to school. So my last, next to my last semester, they tapped me on the shoulder and said, we need leadership development and we need continuous improvement started in Latin America. Could you pick two people to go with you? So the, the, your last two semesters, you're identifying your action research. You're doing all of your research. And then you write your paper and you present. Who has time to go anywhere? So I took two trips for a total of 23 days down to Latin America. Lima, Peru, brought in Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and Mexico, and did some work. And here's what they're like in Latin America. They are social people. 
You don't sit down to eat until 8 at night. You finish around 10. Then they go dancing till midnight. Then they go home and go to bed and they're at work in the morning. So the first two nights, I went dancing till midnight, then got home and studied and wrote till 2 a.m. Went to sleep. The alarm got off at 5. I was up, showered, and in the car to go to the facility at 6. And I thought, I'm going to die in Peru if I keep doing this. So I said, okay, I'm not going dancing anymore. I, I can't. So for every day, my cutoff was 1 a.m. I'd write and study till 1 a.m., go to sleep, up at 5. I got back home, and I wasn't feeling really healthy, and that's because I had a Dr. Pepper every night at 11, a, or 11 p.m. to give me the energy to stay awake till 1. As you all know in the healthcare industry, you don't want to put sugar in your body that late at night. Uh, and so I came back and I said to my husband, you know what, I, I'm good. I've gotten everything I wanted out of my master's studies. I don't need to finish and I don't need to walk. Because I didn't, there was no more of me to give. And my husband said, okay, so if you don't finish, how will you feel in three months? And I said, I don't know. He goes, will you feel like you quit? And that was like, ah. Oh. I go, I will. He goes, all right, then finish. And so I finished. But multiple times in those last four months, I wanted to say, okay, I'm good, I'm good. So you will also be challenged. Um, <coughs> some of you are parents. I suspect most or all of you work and you're going to go to school. So be proud of the fact that you're investing in yourself. Be cognizant of the fact there's only so much of you. Okay? And what might, might you need to let go of so you can finish your studies? You can finish investing in you. And not say, oh, I'll come back to it in a year or so. Do you know how many young adults I coach that some of the things they're dealing with is that they never finish school? They were just going to take a year off and make some money. Or it got, it got kind of crazy. So I'll just keep working and I'll come back to my studies later. So you'll be challenged. Okay? And the tools you're going to learn today, please use them. My name and number is at the bottom, I think, of every page. If you feel like quitting and you're not sure, pick up the phone and call me. We'll talk about it. All right, so here we go. Page uh, two. There's a reason that you're in school. So I want you to stay in the left-hand column only. Okay? What are you working towards, or what are you fighting for, or who are you going to be? Fill in the left-hand column. Answer one or all those questions, whichever one grabs you. But you're here because you're going after something. All right, I would like you to share at your table with each other. Um, pick at least one thing. You know, what are you going for? You know, what are you fighting for? Who do you want to be? And share at your tables. Hey, hold on. Time out. Time out. Okay, time out. So if you're fighting for something, you're going after something, how come you're saying I would like to be this? Sit up and say it with gusto. All right, go, share. All right, one person per table, please stand up. Love it, nice job. First one. Okay. Who, who wants to go first? You will? Okay, so tell me. What are you working for? What are you fighting for? Who do you want to be? I said I'm working towards having a better life for myself and my family and by working to work my way up in the medical field for nursing will be a good stability for my family. So, you know, times get rough sometimes. Got to live paycheck to paycheck. So, I said doing that is my stride to. Hmm, how's it feel to say that? It feels good. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. All right. How about back here? 
What are you going after? What am I, I'm going for my nursing degree so that I can give my dog all the toys he wants. Uh, <laughs> and, and what kind of dog? <laughs> he is a Labrador Coonhound mix. He's wow. Five months old. And how big is he going to get? He, the doctor said between 100 to 120 pounds. You're going to have to work two jobs. Yeah. No, no, that's not awesome. Good. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> okay. What are you working for? What are you going after? Uh, to be an RN, to make money, and be the best version of myself. Shut up. I don't know. <laughs> to, be the, to be the best version of you? Yeah. So we haven't seen the best version yet? No. Oh, nice. Good job. That's right. Congrats. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I might cry. I'm going to cry. What are you going for? So I said, I'm fine for my nursing degree. I've been at it since 2011, you guys. It's okay. Uh, I did my pre-regs at MATC, and then I went to Brian and Stratton, and it just hasn't worked out. Okay. But you're here. And I'm working towards being a better mother, a better provider. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. No, overall, great person. Thank you. Um, I want to be a psychiatric mental health mm. uh, nurse practitioner. That's the goal. Um, I want to own my own practice. And I really like mental illness is very serious. And I yeah. think people like kind of push it to the side. So I'm just ready to change the world and really just help and support. And just, I don't know. Awesome. Ready. All right. So it, it doesn't matter when you started and how long it takes. It matters that you get where you want to be and you become who you want to become. No one puts a timetable on it. Okay. Awesome. Just awesome. So you all know where you're going and what you're going for. Now I want you to go to the right-hand column and why. You can pick, pick the most important one or the strongest one from your left-hand column. Why do you want to do this? And before you write any further, okay, some of you might say, oh, I've always dreamed of wearing scrubs. Not a why. Some of you might say, oh, okay, money. Okay, money, yes, but money, why? Because it might get you. So we're going to go a little bit deeper than the surface. Why are you going after this? All right, I would like you to share at the table, and I want you to share only your why. Don't tell them the what that it's associated to, and share it with passion so they, they can feel it and hear it. Go. All right. Three things that impact how resilient you are are how you handle challenges, how you handle control or lack thereof, and how you handle responsibility. Three key things that play into how resilient you are. So just think for a moment. How do you handle challenges? You don't have to answer out loud, just think. How do you handle control when you have a lot of control when you have very little control? How do you handle responsibility? Weaving in and out of these determines your resiliency. All right, so I ask you what, you know, what are you working towards? Because life's going to be crazy at times. Okay? But there's got to be a why. Why are you going after it? Because when the world goes upside down or you go upside down in the world, your why will keep you going. So one person, a different person at each table, please stand up. All right, so I want to hear your why with passion. I prefer you not read it unless you think, hey, I got it, I got it better on paper. But I want to hear it. I don't want to hear your what. I just want to hear the why. You ready? Sure. Uh, because of that feeling in my soul, it just feels like it's where I'm supposed to be. Oh. What I'm supposed to do. Nice. And you know that feeling? Yeah. OK. How did you know? When that feeling showed up, how did you know to say, this is it? I don't know. OK, but you went with it yeah. instead of being afraid of it. Mm -hmm. OK, so what are you going to be? What are you going after? Um, for the, do you want like the reasoning for that 
Um, yeah, what's the what? Um, I want to be a mother someday, so who provides and can do that person for her children. So I'm not a mother yet, but okay. I want to one day be one. So you want to provide? Yeah. Okay, why? It just feels right. Okay, so when you provide for your children, how will that impact them? Um, it shows them that I care and that they can do it too. Okay, so when they feel when they know they're cared for and they feel loved, how do they show up in the world? Can you repeat your question? Sorry. Yes. When your children know they're cared for and know that they're loved and they can feel it, how do they go and show up in the world? Um, they do the same thing. Oh, so they pay it forward, they pass it on. So what's our world like when everyone is cared for and there's a lot of love? Yeah, how do people show up? Anybody, how do you show up? When you feel cared for and you know you're loved? Better. Positive? What else? Better. Better? What else? You can say better? Happy. Yeah, happy. Yeah. What's the result of better and happy? Better world. Better world. It just keeps going. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Let that why be your driver. All right. All right. Tell me your why. Well, I've been seeing you for about nine years now, and I just enjoy taking care of my residents, and I feel like I can do more for them if I become an LPN. Okay, so you told me what you were going to do. Tell me why you're doing that. Why are you going after it? Something I really enjoy, and I just want to improve myself. Oh, okay, so of course, we want to do something we enjoy. And you want to improve yourself. What happens when you improve you? I feel good about myself. Oh, and when you improve you and you show up every day feeling good about you, what do you give those that you're going to serve? It kind of reflects onto them. Yes. My nickname at work is Smiley, so. Nice, okay, and smiles are contagious. Yeah, I just shared something on uh, my Facebook page for my business, and it was two people smiling at each other, and that radiated into half of the person next to them, then they turn and smiled to them, and it radiated now to two people, and half of the people next to them, they turned and smiled, and two becomes four, four becomes eight, and pretty soon the whole crowd was lit up. You have no idea the impact you're going to have, and if you continue to improve yourself, you will continue to improve how you serve others. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay. Come on. Why are you going to do it? to reduce the doubt and anxiety of not giving myself credit and um, like always second guessing myself. Oh, so you've got the beat me up stick. Yeah, yeah that's pretty fun, isn't it? No. <laughs> no, it's not at all. You know, there's enough in the world to beat us up. Don't beat yourselves up. Right. Are you perfect? No. <laughs> huh. Are you perfect? How about you? Are you perfect? I'm not either. Okay, no one is and we all have flaws. We all have impediments or handicaps. Sometimes you can see or hear them with people and other times you can't. We all have imperfections. Okay, so give me your why again. My why? Oh, to reduce doubt and anxiety of not giving myself credit and, ah, okay. and always second guessing. Myself. Okay, yeah. so when you reduce doubt and anxiety and you start giving yourself credit for who you are and what you do, how will you show up differently? More confident. Oh, more Which confident. What my okay, <laughs> and what is your name? Rachel. Rachel, what does the more confident Rachel look like? Show me. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, hey, did you see it? <laughs> yeah, and you laugh. Yeah, and when you're more confident and you step into the world of those you're going to serve, what do they get? They get like a better outcome, like I guess like yeah, better treatment, better care, oh, better experience. Yeah, because you love you and you believe in you, and that oozes out of you and goes to them. And what, ha what are you going to be? I'm going to be an LPN first and then the first person. Okay, so you're going to be an LPN. Mm -hmm. What happens when you make the people you serve feel good about themselves? It makes me feel good. Yeah, what does it, it do to them? It helps them with their healing. Yes, their healing. Yeah. yes, that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That is awesome. All right, give it to me. It's really similar, but basically I said because I've lived most of my life for another person and I just need to figure out who I am. 
Excellent. Now, we're going to start over because you said basically. Oh, it's not basically. I suspect your heart's pounding right now. Okay, so give it to me again. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because I've lived my life for other reasons and I need to figure out who I am. Ah, okay. And will you do that? Yes. Yes, you will. And when you figure out who you are and you live for you, okay, how does that impact those you're going to serve? Better because I know who I am and what I can give to them. Oh, okay. So I'm hearing some confidence. You're going to have some confidence. Yeah. Yeah. And you walk in to serve an individual and you've got confidence and you're comfortable in who you are. What message does that send to them? That they can be comfortable with me. Yes. And when they're comfortable with you, what does that do to their life? Make it a little bit better. Yeah. And isn't that what we want, to make it life a little bit better? Yep. Awesome. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. All right. So you have to understand your why. That's at your heart and soul. Why do you do what you do? And it is way beyond the paycheck. Okay. That's an outcome of doing what you want to do. This is way beyond the paycheck. Okay. Um, and I will tell you, um, you touch lives and you touch hearts. You change lives and you change hearts with what you do. Okay. There's a reason I'm not in the healthcare field. I do not have the intestinal fortitude. I get sweaty and queasy and all vomity feeling when I I see people that aren't in good health. Now, growing up on the farm, I have done surgery on cows, on goats, I've castrated pigs, I've done, you name it, have done it. But when it comes to humans, there's something inside of me that just says, oh, get out of here and get out of here now. And so I applaud you for what you do. You do some, you're going to be doing something every day that I can't even fathom doing. And, and it's so bad that I literally think if I was out of work and my family was almost at the, at the end financially and that was it, I could go be an LPN or I, I think I would hesitate. Or most people say, I'll take that job. Okay. So do not cut yourself short what you're doing is going to touch lives and change lives. Okay? So when things get tough and you're in school and things get tough in life, you pull this sheet back out and you reread to yourself out loud what you're going after and why you're going after it because it matters. All right, so let's look what the dictionary says resiliency is. It's, it's a virtue, which really is, virtues are things that are excellences that we develop. Okay? Um, some philosophers call them positive character traits. But it's something that you're excellent at. Uh, and we're not born with it, and we're not given it. You have to develop it. Okay? What is one thing that you became excellent at at about 8 to 14 months old? What's something you became excellent at? Crawling, Crawling and walking. And how many times do you think you fell down? How many bruises did you have? How many times do you think you cried? But you kept doing it day after day after, and you became excellent at it. Because I saw every one of you walk in here today. And look at all the different shoes. We are so excellent, we can change our shoes every day and still stay standing. Okay. So a virtue is something that you're excellent at. Okay, and you have to practice it. If you want to be excellent, practice it. Because excellence feeds your resiliency. Okay. Um, so here they say resilience is a virtue that allows us to move through hardships and come out better. And this is my perspective on resiliency. It is not hitting something, bouncing back and say, whoo, I was resilient. I say, no, I wasn't. I didn't work through it. Resiliency is about pushing through what is challenging you and you come out the other side stronger and wiser and more experienced. Okay. So I love this, that no one escapes pain, fear, or suffering. If you have a heartbeat, you're going to have pain, fear, and suffering. But from pain can come wisdom. 
From fear can come courage. From suffering can come strength. If you're resilient and say, this is just another step on my path in life. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the science behind it. False. The longer we tough it out, the tougher we get, and thus the more successful we are. That's false. Okay. The lack of recovery period is dramatically holding back your ability to be resilient. In the business world, it's $62 billion a year. And what do you think makes up that $62 billion? People that just keep pushing through and never take any breaks. And we got $62 billion in the business world. What is that? Come on, what, what, what happened that we ta tallied $62 billion? How about retention? How about health care issues? Suicides? People falling asleep, driving home, having accidents? It's health and wellness. Okay. You talked about mental health. It's health and wellness. Okay. So that's false. Let's look at the next one. Resilience, resilience is bred from an early age. It is not. Here's what our parents do to us. Okay, so it's through bad habits learned when you're young. They get magnified when you enter the workforce. Uh, because our parents teach us that resiliency, uh, they teach it the wrong way that, again, we're supposed to just keep pushing. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Push harder, work harder. And we grow up, and those bad habits that we're learning get bigger and badder, and when we enter the workforce, they work against us. Okay. Look at this. Every one of you in here, a lack of sleep, for each one of you, is 11 days of lost productivity every year. So I want you to think right now of the team that you work closest with. Think of, think of your team at work, and how many people are on that team. Now multiply that times 11. And your employer pays for that many lost days of productivity because people just keep pushing through. And on average, it's $2,300 for each one of you every year. Now take that $2,300 times the number of workers that are on your team. It adds up fast. How many of you, last night, when you went to go to bed, you looked at your phone and it said uh, 3%? How many of you plugged it in? Okay, let me ask it another way. Who plugged their phone in before they went to bed last night? Ah, yeah, why? Why do you plug it in? Oh, you want your battery fully charged for today? Yeah. We treat our cell phones better than we treat ourselves. When was the last time you plugged yourself in to recharge you? Or do you just keep pushing through at 11 lost days of productivity a year? $2,300 just for you. Okay. True, we receive 11 million bits of information every second. I just couldn't fathom this. I had to go back and look it up. Okay? And this is what Rich says. <laughs> uh, but we can only process 40 bits of information a second. What happens with all of that? You know what this reminds me of? All of my boys played volleyball. My two older boys played club volleyball, so we would be down at the Wisconsin Center in Milwaukee, and they would have 36 volleyball courts set up. Guys on one side, girls on the other. Every half second, there was a whistle going off. And there was screaming, and there was clapping, and there was yelling. And I am an off-the-chart extrovert, but that was a sensory overload. We hit noon, and I looked at my husband, and I said, when does this end? He said, about five. I go, I don't know how much longer I can take this. It was just nonstop. So 11 million bits of information coming at you and you can only have 40 stick? 
constant stimulation. Okay? That's why I say school of silence, detachment breaks, mental agility, and cultivate compassion. Let's start at the bottom. How compassionate are you with you? Compassion that says, I need a break. I'm just going to go take a walk outside the building. Or I'm just going to close my office door. Or I'm going to, I'm going to read a book. Or I'm going to go to my car and just sit for a while. Will you do that? Most of you won't. Because what if somebody sees you sitting in your car? What if somebody sees you walking around the building and they're still working and they're busy? The human body is not meant to sit idle, so we think if we're moving, we're doing and we're producing. But we're not. I'm doing, I'm moving, but at what level of quality? Okay. And I talk about the school of silence. I call it carpet time. Okay? And I'm going I'm to act this out for you. Okay? So, uh, when my two older boys, so I have a 10 year gap between son number two and son number three. So when I say two older boys, and you go, wait, I thought she said she had three. I do. But son number three hadn't come along yet. So my two older boys, I'm working about 50 hours a week. I'm traveling all over the United States, and they're young. But here's what I would do to justify it. I'd get up at 3.10 in the morning. I live out in Merton to drive to the airport and catch a 6.15 flight. Go wherever I needed to go, spend the day with the client, then catch the, the red eye home. I rarely stayed overnight. Catch the red eye home. I'd pull back in my garage somewhere between midnight and 2 a.m. I'd walk in the house. I'm carrying this whole day with me. But when the boys woke up the next day at 5.30, mom was there. It was like she was never gone. I did that for about 11 months, and I was dying. I had nothing left. So I came home one night. It was about midnight, 1 o'clock, and we had this obnoxious clock on the wall that my mother had given me years ago that she thought I would like. And it just tick-tock, tick-tock, all day long, all night long. And every half hour it goes, dong. And on the hour, gosh forbid it's midnight or 12 noon, it goes on forever. And I couldn't stand that thing. But for some reason I came home this night and I said, I have got to let go of my day. And so I laid down. Hold on, Nate, I won't smash it. And I laid on the living room floor just like this. Tick, tock, tick, tock. And I'm like, well, that's kind of meditating. And I just laid here until my body melted into the carpet. And I felt like, ah, oh, OK, I let go of the day. And here's what I say about this. Some people call it mindfulness. I call it carpet time. Because when you look up, what am I looking at? Yeah, the ceiling in my living room, a ceiling fan. Okay? And I just laid there until I felt my day melt away. I can't sit in a chair and look out here and be quiet and go, oh, look at that van. How long has it been since we had a conversion van like that? Not much wind today. Huh, kind of busy. I'm glad I don't live in Brookfield. I can't, I can't go quiet. Okay. So, try carpet time. Every one of my clients has been introduced to it. Uh, there, so I was in Madison yesterday. I was in Milwaukee in the morning, I was in Madison in the afternoon, and I had to come home then. Uh, but I had two clients in Madison, so I laid my seat back. I had a half hour, laid my seat back in the parking lot and just laid like this until I felt myself melt into the seat. You have to recharge. Your phone doesn't work. Your computer doesn't work. Your tablet doesn't work if it's not recharged. My remote didn't work when I got here this morning because the batteries were dead. Actually, when I, I found out when I checked it at home this morning. So where'd I go? I ran over to Walgreens. I wouldn't consider standing here every slide and coming over here and clicking. Who does that? Recharge yourself every single day. It will feed your resiliency. All right, true. Initiatives and programs that foster a resilient mentality, uh, sorry, resilient and mentally healthy workplace 
return $2.30 for every dollar invested. Appreciate the fact if you work for a company or organization that offers programs that help stay mentally charged. Because every dollar they spend, they get $2.30 back. Would you invest in this? If your financial planner said, give me a dollar, I'll guarantee you $2.30 back for every dollar, would you invest in it? Oh, go like this. Yes, you would. You wouldn't even think twice. Yes, you would. Companies understand it. Look what's happening. Lower health care costs, higher productivity, lower absenteeism, and decreased turnover. They can get recharged at work. They can get recharged with work. They appreciate the fact that the organization offers it. So if you work for one of them, be grateful. So if you want to build resilience, start with strategically stopping. I talked about that. Internal recover, external recovery, and cognitive recovery. You got to quiet the brain. And for me, if I can quiet this, the rest goes quiet. Some people quiet this and then the brain goes quiet. I have to quiet this first, then the rest will go quiet. Okay? So when it gets crazy, when you're in the heat of the semester at Herzing, you're working full time, maybe you're working two jobs, you're raising children, you're caring for elderly parents, don't forget to stop and plug you in. Because it will keep you going and you will continue to go after your why. All right, look at this. Anybody want to guess what 47 times is? OK. Look at we laugh. 17,000 times a year, people. Why do we care what other people are doing and what they think? It sucks energy from you. What's 86%? Eighty-six percent of you will check your cell phone while talking to family and friends. Some of you have checked it while I'm talking to you. Yeah. Eighty-five percent check their cell phone within an hour of waking up or an hour before they go to bed. What are you going to do tonight about what's on social media? Okay. Thirty-five percent of you check your cell phone within five minutes of waking up. Oh, look at you, you're going to own it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> really? What? Okay, what are you going to miss? Why? Okay, I'm going to give you a challenge. And I want you to do it every day for the next week. Okay? It's going to cost you nothing. Will you do it? Will you do it? <laughs> Will you do it? <laughs> it's going to cost you nothing. Will you do it? Yes. Okay. If you got your cell phone in bed with you, put this in bed with you. Okay. Yes, don't you laugh at me. And I want you to put it on this page. And when you wake up, before you grab your cell phone, I want you to read your why. Out loud. Because here's what happens. When the words come out your mouth, they go back in your ears, your subconscious grabs onto it and says, oh, this is who Krista wants to be. Plant the course of your day the very first thing. If you read a text and you're like, ah, I can't believe they went out without me. You just set the course for your day. Your whole day is going to be, ah, I can't believe it. Versus, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. The first thing you say to yourself in the morning determines your day. The first thing you put in your mouth in the morning determines your, your health and wellness for the day. Feed yourself positive energy. Read your why. And why are you laughing? You said the first thing you put in your mouth is your health and it was we a, donut. Both had a donut. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. See, that's why I didn't eat it first. I'm going to eat it. Oh, oh, I made you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Way to own your lives. Way to own it. Yeah. But thank you for eating those. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing you say in the morning sets a course for your day. Please read your why. 
make your phone second or third. The first thing you put in your mouth determines your health and wellness for the day. Okay, this is a Zibu angelic symbol for resilience. Okay. So, let me see what's, yeah, let's go here. I'm going to go a little out of order, but at this page, you've got post-it notes in the center of your table. I'd like you each to take one post-it note. And I want you to put on the post-it note one thing in your life that you're concerned with right now. Just one concern in your life. And we are only going to share if you choose to. One thing, and then I want you to put it in the circle of concern. Yeah, we got the green table over here. Yeah. All right, do you have it? So it looks like this. You got one post-it note with one concern in the circle of concern, or you know, anywhere you want in the circle. Now, this is going to be about where you put your time and energy, which feeds your resiliency. Okay. I want you to look at that concern. And I'm going to look at mine and say, uh, what percentage of this concern can I influence? And I'm going to say, you know what? I can influence about 30% of mine. So I'm going to rip it and take the 30% that I can influence, and I'm going to put it in the circle of influence. But the rest, I can't even influence. So I'm going to shred it. And I'm, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm, I'm getting it out of my life. OK? So go through that, please. What percentage of that concern can you influence? Now, if it's all of it, it's all of it. Okay, so it should look like this. You should only have one post-it note on there. Okay, you're an overachiever. <laughs> no, it's okay, go with it. All right, so now think about this. What can you influence? Answer that in your head about your concern. What can you influence? Okay. Who can you influence it with? When should you influence it? And how should you influence? Okay. Answer those questions, and then you go and influence it according to how you answered those questions. Yeah, so what can you influence? Yep, yeah. so here. What can you influence? With whom should you influence? When should you influence? And how should you influence it? Yeah. And then go do that. Okay. Go influence it. And then you have to let go. Okay. So now I look at what I have in the circle of influence, and I say, what percentage of that can I control? And I look at this, and I say, ah, I can control 50% of this here. So I rip it in half. I have part of that in the circle of influence. The other is in the circle of control. Okay? So do that with your, the percentage that you have in influence. You're going to keep. Notice I didn't throw anything out this time. I kept it because I can either influence or I can control. Um, what is that? What is that? Can you rip that up a little more? Great. Get, get it out of your life. You got good. Rip it up. Excellent. Okay. Uh, does anybody not have something in the circle of control? 
Anybody? OK. Huh. You ha she has the tiniest dot. Yeah, but it's something. OK. Um, what is always in the circle of control? Go ahead. Well, you, you brought a concern forward. So you had a concern. You said this is a percentage you can, hey, rip that up some more and get that off the piece of paper. Make it go away. See, look at it. It's stuck around. G get it. Get on it. Yes. OK, so you said you, about 50%, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what, and you said of this, you, you can control that. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. What is always, always, always in the circle of control? OK, can you all come up here, please? All of you, just come up here quickly. Come on. Work it in. We're all going to be right here in this space, right here. Bring it in. Tighter, come on. Tighter, tighter. Bring, no, bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it in. OK, what's right here? This is a circle of control. What's here? Me. Yes. Why are you in the circle of control? Say it again. You can control what? Yes. Always. So I'm going to step out, and I want you to step in. Come on in. OK, you can always control you. You decide, do I, do I react? Do I respond? Do I stay true to who I am? You always can control you, even if in the circle of concern, there was nothing that you could influence. You can always control you. And remember that. That is going to be a key component for you for being resilient. Stop. Breathe, think, what can I influence? I'm always going to control me. What do I need to shred and get rid of? Okay? You can't control the weather. Why do we complain about it? Influence your day by what you say. Okay, and instead of going golfing, I'm going to go to Thirsty Duck and, and Duck Bowl today. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So, influence what you can, when you can, with who you can, how you can, and then move on. But control you. You decide how you want to be, how you want to respond versus react. React is usually your emotions take over and you just react. Respond means I take a breath, I stop and think, and I respond in a way that's true to me. All right. So. It is about working through. It is not about bouncing back. It's about working through. Okay. Um, so here it is, again. It's about working through and coming out the other side. Okay. So you have in your packet, page four. I would like you to identify, so it looks like this, it's got the tree, identify a challenge that you have right now in your life or that you have recently, very recently had. What's the challenge? And write it down. Okay? Just write the challenge down, that's it. The top, the top section. You're facing it right now or You've rec very recently faced it. So while you're doing that, uh, one of your, your fellow students here uh, worked last night. If any of the rest of you worked last night and you're tired and you're sitting here and you're going, whoa, just stand up and, and just move in the area you need to. Feel free to stand. Okay. So it's about moving through the now. So check this out. More than education, more than experience, more than training, a person's level of resilience will determine who succeeds and who fails. 
This is true in the cancer ward and it's true in the Olympics and it's true in the boardroom. Do you know one of those persons that just keeps going no, no matter how much dung life throws at them? Okay. Your resiliency matters. So if you don't believe it, ask the Holocaust victims. Ask the Boston Marathon bomber survivors. Ask our veterans. Ask surviving uh, parents and siblings that have lost loved ones. Okay. All right, so it's less about what you have and it's more about who you are. Okay. Um, so, Choi, okay, so you know what? I think I clicked past where I needed to be when I was getting all excited on the break. I'm like, where, where's my slides? Okay. That was pretty good. That was pretty close. Oh, good Lord, Krista. Get it together. All right. So it is. Uh, it's a choice. And you always have a choice. And here's the great thing. If you make a choice and you don't like it, make another one. No choice is forever. Okay. So it's less about what you have, and it's more about who you are. So choice, no choice. You don't have a choice to feel pain. If you're human, you feel pain. Okay, that's a reality. You have a choice of whether you want to suffer or not. That is absolutely a choice. Okay. And, and suffering is created by what is your perception of the pain and your life and the world around you. What is that relationship? So remember in the beginning I said, how do you handle a change, control, and responsibility? How easily do you adjust? Okay. All right, so here's what happens. Your sense of self, when you look at yourself in the mirror and what you believe, you have a, you have a sense of self. And you say, this is who I'm going to be. And so that's your identity. That identity has commitments, expectations, and values that go with that identity. Both of those, your sense of self and your identity, you make a promise to yourself to live up to it. So here's an example. I said, I am going to be a life coach. A life coach has expectations that go with it. According to the International Coaching Federation, there's a code of ethics and there's competencies. And I am supposed to conduct myself in a certain way. And then my values that I believe and how I want to coach fall right in here. And so the fact that I say, I'm going to be a coach, and here's my expectations, I make that promise to myself, and I start acting it every day and living up to it. And I become it. So what's the identity that you want? Because you will form your life into it. And if you say, I want to be an LPN, I want to be an RN, I want to be a physical therapist, I want to be in medical management, Healthcare management. You, you say, that's my identity. And then, how do you want to live it? What's the expectations and responsibilities? What's your values that go with it? That becomes your identity. You walk it and you talk it every day, and you become it. And several of you said, I want to become a better version of me. You do that by continually raising the bar on your identity. And you talk it and walk it every day, even when those around you don't or won't. You can either stand tall and say, this is who I'm going to be, or everyone else is kind of doing this. Maybe I'll go that way. Okay. All right, there's three overlaps. When you study resiliency, there's three overlaps that were very consistent in the theories. Okay. And the first one is facing down reality. A lot of the researchers said, optimism. Do you truly understand what has happened to you or what is happening, and do you understand it? And when you truly understand it, and you know what's happening, you can allow yourself to endure what's going to happen. And you go into it with optimism. You know, you hear glass half full, glass half empty, sun coming up, sun going down. 
optimism. Okay? Life's loss and found. Okay? Life is challenging you. You're losing something, but you're finding something in your optimism. That's the first overlap. The second overlap is the search for meaning. Resilient people are able to create constructs to say, okay, this happened, but if I bridge it to my life, here's how I can connect it versus life is over. It'll never be the same. They build a construct. They bridge it. Okay? And, the, and you have strong and consistent value systems when you can do that. So you've lost something, but you found something because you bridged it to the present. There can always, always, always be a connection with the challenges you have. Sometimes we see them right away, sometimes we don't. The third overlap is ritualized ingenuity. It's creativeness. How creative can you be to deal with the situation? Some people call it problem solving. It's creativity. How creative can you be to deal with the situation? And that comes right back to your circle of control. The three overlaps. So now I want you to look at that page four and you told me what your challenge was, face it. What's the reality? Bring context to it. Fill out the next section. What's the reality of it? And then what are you afraid of? And then what's your creative way to deal with it? As you're writing, I'm standing here trying to think of a term. Um, there's another group that is doing studies on resiliency and they're talking about the value of emotional writing. And they're studying a group that they journal. So they've had a trauma or a concern in their life or a loss, and they start writing. And they get it out of their system, and they continue to write. And they, the studies have found those that are writing are becoming more resilient. They're moving past and moving on and, and continuing with their identity. And so th that's part of the reason I always have a participant packet and have you write it out. It's the beginning. So if you've ever thought about journaling or you do journal or you slow down in journaling, journal while you're in school and let go of stuff at the end of the day. In the morning, write about what you're grateful for. Okay? It's an emotional release. Laughing, it, you know, ha, ha, ha. It's kind of the same as crying. It uses the same diaphragm muscles, and it's, it's a form of release. So sometimes we say to people, this is a traumatic situation, and why are you laughing? It's a form of release. Okay? So write it out. What are you going after? What is the reality? Face it first. Come right face to face. What's the reality? Okay. How do you bridge what's happened to where you're at and where you want to go? And what's your creative solution? Don't wait for somebody else to figure it out. You figure it out. Your own solution. OK. Anybody have the urge to share? <laughs> I'm getting some no's. All right. So we did the circle control. I moved that around in the presentation based on the group. But now, OK, you have habits. You have pathways carved in your brain of how you think. And I say you need to do neurological road construction. Okay? So each one of you has this little coin. Grab that, please. And then there's markers on your table. Color matters. If you don't have the color you want, let me know. I've got lots more markers. Paint. Oh, right there? Is this pink letter color? Yeah. All right. Anybody else see a different color? Yeah, there's red in here, something right there. My favorite color. Okay. So here's how it works. You're driving along in your car at 55 miles an hour. You're talking to a friend. You're singing to the radio. You missed the first sign that said road closed ahead. Road closed in one mile. You missed the second sign that says road closed 1,500 feet. You come over the hill and you go, there's all kinds of barricades and you go, ah, you hit the brakes. 
you stop. You can't go that way anymore. You turn around, you figure out how to go a different way. That's what you have to do in your head. You have carved, pathways carved in your brain. It's habitual ways of thinking without even noticing. You just go there. Okay? You need a pattern interrupt. And that's what this is. You need one word that you can say to yourself and stop it. Okay? So if the pattern is always to go, oh yeah, the, oh yeah, great, the world is doing this to me again, it goes down that pathway. You gotta stop it. And your one word stops it. So I'll share with you, my one word is shazam. That makes me stop and say, do I wanna do that again or do I purposely wanna go the other way that I, I've been talking about? Other clients have their one word, it's boom, toodaloo, burrito, breathe, love. What is your one word that when you say it, it will stop you and you can decide to redirect? So put your one word on your coin. Now, if you want to put a symbol on the back side of the coin, have at it. But one side should just have a word. OK, everybody have it? OK, the person at the table that hasn't stood up yet, please stand up with your coin. <laughs> All right. Hold your coin up. What's your one word? Um, it's <laughs> Blanche. Blanche. All right. Hey. We can laugh, but it only has to mean something to you. Okay, say it like you mean it. Don't look at your sister. Say, look right here. Say it like you mean it. Oh, sorry. Say it good, girl. Blanche. Is that how you'd say it? I don't know. I mean, I, you got to stop. You got to really stop. I laugh when I say it anyway, oh, so okay. I feel like it. So let me hear it. Blanche. Okay. Wait, can I get that on? No, no. Okay. So when you say Blanche, yeah. and how you say it matters. You know, if I looked at mine and went, Shazam. What is that going to stop? Shazam. Blanche. Blanche. Breathe. Yeah. It's that you say it with conviction. And now you stop yourself, and you've got a decision which way do you want to go. Nice. Well done. Okay. Here we come. What is it? Future. Oh, would you say it just like that? I hope so. <laughs> say it again. Future. Okay. Do you notice her face? Yeah. Yeah, kind of like, future? <laughs> yeah, okay. So it, it's been working for you? It does, yeah. Okay, what's it do? It makes me stop what I'm doing and go, wait a minute. I got to rethink this. Okay. Chill for a minute. Oh, nice. Excellent! That's awesome. Okay, continue to use it. Here we come. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. Come on, what's your one word? I don't have like a word, I have like a phrase. Oh, what's the phrase? Like just don't freak out. Don't freak out. Okay, pick one, pick one word from that. Don't. Okay, Is, will that work for you? Yeah. Write it down. Okay, so you're going to get an example of a sentence here. Okay, stand up, please. Okay, so pick your coin up, and your word is don't. don't. All right, so you can use the whole sentence, but emphasize that word. Let's hear it. Don't freak out. <laughs> is that going to stop? What's happening up here? Come on, say it from the gut. <sighs> <It's too early. laughs> no, it's, did you work last night? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'll give you a little slack. Okay, it's over. Do it. Don't freak out. Okay, and it's going to stop. And you can now say, which way do I want to go? Yeah, and use it. Don't freak out. Yeah, but you need the whole sentence for you, but use the word don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you didn't fall asleep today. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so here's the other thing. It's how you say it in your mouth and here. Shazam! And it makes me stop and say, come on, Morrissey. But mine's also a motivator. Shazam! Okay. So if anybody here, uh, I want you to take this and keep this where you see it every day. 
dash to your car, by your computer, carry it with you. If anybody says, well, I'd like a second one, let me know. I've got more. But I want you to write your word on it before you go. Okay? So that's your pattern interrupt. Did anybody not get a chance to stand? Because I would sure hate that. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So it's about how resilient are you and what is the one thing you can do. You've been filling out this packet. You've got more than one thing to do. Okay? Change your bedtime habit. Change your wake-up habit. Use this packet. Feed your brain first. Shut it off at night. Okay? So you've got to own it. You've got to own it. Every phase of your life. If you want this, go after it. Okay? Failure is growth. Growth is happiness. Happiness is fulfillment. How many times do you think this little child failed? Or as they say, started anew again and again and again? You said earlier, do you think hundreds of thousands of times you fall down? But why do they continue to get back up? Determined. Why don't we get back up? Okay. Get back up. Time and time again. So I'll let you read this. Anybody see her in Iron Lady? If not, it's worth Googling it just to listen to her say this. It's pretty powerful. Okay. Um, don't overcomplicate this. It's not complicated. It's a packet. It's a coin. It's a circle with post-it notes. It's your why. Why are you doing what you're doing? What are you going after? And go after it. And if you feel the desire that, ah, I just think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, I'm going to quit, Okay? You've got all the people you met here this morning at Herzing. You've got a number. Pick up the phone and call so that you don't regret. I would have I tremendously regretted quitting without a doubt. And that's all my husband had to say is how will you feel about quitting. Okay. So I'll leave you with this last thought. We as choosers have the right to choose. But once the choice is chosen, the choice controls the chooser. So choose wisely. Thank you for investing, believing enough and loving yourself enough to invest in you. And thank you for what you're going to do when you're done with your education, something that I can't. So I applaud you. Okay? Have fun. Thank you. Yeah.